Welcome to the COSA Showcase. I'm Maddie Morris, joined by Ron Thulin. That's right, Ron and Keith. Now, not only does Autry Golden play wide receiver for the Miners, but he's also their top kickoff returner. John said he looked into getting tickets for tonight's game, but it was just a little out of his price range. So you guys were able to win at home yet again. You're undefeated here at home. Do you guys have a special mojo here? <laughs> As you can see, there is a huge crowd out here. You know, he's catching fish, he's catching touchdowns. Who knows what he's going to do today in the game? While the setting changes quite a bit, the name remains the same. It's the battle of the two Columbias here in South Carolina. After another outstanding performance and leading his team to a conference championship, I've had the opportunity to sit down with WKU quarterback and Conference USA MVP Brandon Dowdy to talk about the game, the season, and his career as a Hilltopper. Hello, everybody. I'm outside Kauffman Stadium, where three hours before game time, people are already tailgating. Mississippi State has the Junction, Ole Miss has the Grove, and Mizzou, well, we're still trying to find our niche. Now, when two teams play each other, they're normally playing against each other for a victory. But in the first meeting between two CUSA schools this weekend, the two teams will be united under something more than just the game. Coaches have a huge impact on their players, both on and off the field. Phil Ratliff was no different. The players respect him because they knew that he loved them, and he would coach them really hard, and they would never, you know, they would never give up on them. They would always give them everything they had. He wanted to see his players succeed. He wanted to win, no doubt, but he wanted to see his players succeed. Not only on the field, he wanted to see them get their high school diplomas, go on to college, get a job, have a family, you know, live the life that he was living. He always encouraged his players to play with high intensity and energy, just as he did when he was an offensive lineman at Marshall. Phil was very competitive. He would not give up, uh, and that's, that's something you knew you could count on. Uh, he was going to have your back no matter what. Uh, he was like that on or off the field, and he played with an intensity and a, a very high level uh, in everything that he did. If he was playing checkers, he wanted to win, and it, it showed on the field. In 2006, after years of coaching at the high school and FCS level, he returned to Marshall as a coach until something else came along. But then an opportunity to really try to do something special with Charlotte came along. Brad Lambert, you know, tried and tried and tried to get him down there, and finally he was able to lure him down there. And I think it was the, it was the challenge of building a program from really just the beginning. Welcome to the family, basically, bud. Ratliff, the offensive line coach and recruiting coordinator, was an integral part of building the football program from the ground up until this year, the program's first year at the FBS level. But Ratliff unexpectedly passed away in August following a heart attack just weeks before the first game of the season affecting everyone on the 49ers team. When we lost Coach Ratliff, it wasn't just losing you know, the offensive line coach and the guys that were close to him at that position, but it was every single position because defensive backs and receivers and quarterbacks, they'd all been recruited by him. You know, really was the heart and soul of this team. I felt like you know, he really was the guy that uh, I think tied the whole team together. And not only did his death affect the Charlotte community, but the Marshall community as well. If you can go through life and uh, and have the reputation and the, uh, the experience that he did with the community. Uh, he was loved and he'll forever be missed, but his imprint is on this community and there's no doubt about that. Though it has been hard for both those in Charlotte and in Huntington, members of both communities want to keep his memory and legacy alive. For the Rather family! Yes, <laughs> His team will move on, we'll move on, and we're all better people because he was part of our life. You know, he made a difference. Everywhere he went, he made a difference. He thought this team was um, going to be built on the linemen, uh, being the rock of this team and really uh, being the foundation for that. And so just trying to teach these young men that the, the biggest legacy that we can keep going for Coach Ratliff is to just be rock solid. Guys really began to see how, especially the O-line, how Coach Ratliff was embedded in their hearts. And there's some things that they do naturally because he coached them so hard. And there's some things that they'll continue to do out of respect for Coach Ratliff and how, they co how he coached them. And with both his teams squaring off against each other this weekend, both communities will continue to support each other through the loss of a man who touched so many people's lives. And I think both teams, you know, will be involved in his, uh, his presence and his spirit being on both sidelines. It's really kind of, not many guys can do that. Charlotte's not playing Marshall. I'm rooting for Charlotte and, and everything they do. I want to see them succeed and grow and I, because Phil had a part in that. And uh, that's special to me and special to many in this community.
Now, as we recognize veterans this week, we wanted to share one CUSA official's amazing story of service to our country. By the offense number 15. From a fan's perspective, Rodney Burnett is no more than a man in a black and white striped shirt calling a player for holding. But there's more to Burnett's story than throwing flags each weekend. They didn't tell us what happened. I was just real hurt, real bad. I couldn't walk. Uh, my chest was injured real bad. My shoulder was uh, just messed all messed up. So really I didn't get to talk to anyone about what had happened. I still didn't know what had happened. In 1983, when he was serving in the Marines overseas in Beirut, Lebanon, Burnett's life changed forever when his barracks was bombed. Well, I just got off guard duty that morning and the alarm went off. Uh, I would got off at 6 and it was about 6.20 and the alarm went off and then I ran to the top of the stairs with the my guys right behind me and got to the top of the stairs, saw a big dust ball and can make out the wheel well of a truck. And then I don't remember any explosion or sound or anything. After being found in a body bag barely conscious four days after the bombing, Burnett was taken to numerous hospitals where over the course of time he learned what had happened as well as some other news. They told me with my mama present that by the time I was 35, I could not walk again. But Burnett refused to accept that as his fate. My full-time goal at that time was to get better. And I, and I wanted to walk, I mean, so I did everything I could to, to walk again. Rehab was three times a day, and it was just all kind of workouts, uh, water treatments, uh, e-stems, uh, no medicine per se other than pain relief. Over the course of a year and a month, little by little, he regained the ability to walk. First I could move my toe up, push my toe down, do it sideways, and then put weight on it and then take the first step, just progressing. And in an attempt to move on, Burnett stumbled across a job that he grew to love. Well, I was at home down at Camp Lejeune and they had a little newspaper up to the house and it said, uh, clock operators pay $25. So I called them, next thing I know I'm doing clock games. And then my third clock game, the official on the field went down injured and I took his spot and been going ever since. For a 53-year-old man who was once told he wouldn't be able to walk by the age of 35, Burnett has spent the past 15 years running all over the field as a college football referee. Just do what you can do to take everything out of the mix of you not getting well. Just keep working hard and if, it, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. He says he will never forget his past and the pain and suffering he endured. I don't get over it, you know, because it was very traumatic you know, the pain level and losing all my friends and just the overall scheme of things. But he is glad he has found a new passion that has become a huge part of his life. Perseverance, I mean, I just weathered the storm and got better and do it. Did I have a goal of refereeing while I was trying to get better? No, it just fell in line. Behind every successful team is a motivated coach who truly loves and enjoys his or her job. That's exactly case in point at WKU. People ask all the time, like, how do you do it? Like, and I'm like, I got, to, I got a dream job. Like, I do something I love to do. Head coach Michelle Clark Hurd's passion for coaching at WKU isn't just because it's her first head coaching gig. Clark Hurd was a member of the Lady Toppers herself from 1986 to 1990. Me having a chance to come back and, and coach at my alma mater and be around a lot of people uh, that I still uh, had ties with and still had relationships with and that's the part that is so awesome and amazing uh, for me. Taking over a team in 2012 that posted a 10-21 and 21 record before her arrival, she wanted to get the program back on track to where it had once been. The level of uh, the expectations that the staff and I constantly put on them and wanted them to understand and know that this program has a ton of rich history and uh, we just wanted to continue to kind of bring that back and and work as hard as we could to make sure that uh, Western Kentucky became relevant again. And that's exactly what she has done. Since taking the reins, the Lady Tubbers have won two conference tournament championships, made two NCAA tournament appearances, and have won more than 70% of their games. Those things, I think, uh, really put uh, Western Kentucky Lady Top of Basketball where people really started to continue to recognize that we're growing and getting back to where we need to. After being named the CUSA Coach of the Year and one of the Pat Summit Trophy finalists last season, she was selected as an assistant coach for the Pan American women's basketball team this past summer. It was like a dream come true. Uh, any coach uh, would love to have the opportunity to represent your country, uh, but to be a part and be chosen and understanding and knowing 
how many amazing coaches have been involved in USA Basketball. Clark Hurd said coaching on the international stage has without a doubt been one of the highlights of her career thus far. Just so humbled and thankful that, you know, I had the opportunity and, you know, not to, you know, to represent your country is crazy. Like every single time when they was uh, about to do um, our national anthem before every game, it just like gives you chills. But she realizes that it wouldn't have been possible without WKU. I just think it's, uh, it gives a lot of credit uh, to this program and to our players and to the coaches uh, because all the things that they, you know, I'm the one that's in the forefront, but we all know. Uh, to have, to, for me sitting here and have those accomplishments to be able to coach USA uh, basketball and to get, you know, these awards, it all comes from everyone else. And so I give a lot of credit to everyone that's surrounded around me.